Hello, I'm Robert Latham, and welcome to the initiative Marxist Studies in Global and Asian Perspective at York University. We're recording this as part of our York Left Consortium, Reflections on Capitalism's Half-Life. And I'm joined from York by Raju Das and Nithya Nagarajan. This initiative began as a blog focused on the political, economic, and social dimensions of COVID. And a second phase of this consortium has begun and it's focused on theory and practice, specifically on what academic work can imply for today's living struggles against capitalism and for the advancement of socialism around the world. I turn now to my colleague, Roger Das, who will introduce our esteemed guest today, Sheila Delaney, and we'll discuss her work and its political implications. Roger. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to, to you, uh, Professor Sheila Delaney. Um, uh, Professor Delaney was, uh, is Emerita Professor of English at Simon Fraser University. She retired from SFU um, in 2006. Uh, Dr. Delaney received her BA from uh, Wesley, Wellesley College, Massachusetts in 96, 1961. Her MA was from University of California at Berkeley in 60, 1963. She obtained her PhD in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia University in 1967. Um, not many people finish uh, in four years from MA. Wow, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, I've never seen anyone finish a uh, PhD in six years in my life anyway, but anyway, oh. you, you, are, you, are, you are very different. Uh, Dr. Delani has written or edited or translated, you can't count uh, her number of books and articles uh, very comfortably without, uh, without confusion. Uh, she has uh, written or edited or translated a large number of books and has written literally countless number of journal articles uh, on the medieval studies and related topics, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. Her scholarship has been recognized by grants and awards, including from uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Senior uh, uh, Killiam uh, Prize. The books she has written or edited uh, or in fact translated, include, for example, uh, medieval literary politics, uh, shapes of ideology in 19, published in 1990, writing women, women writers and women in literature, medieval to modern in 2007, turn it again, Jewish medieval studies and literary theory 2007, anti-sense 2012, and for and against the Bible in 2020, the last one from Brill. Uh, I mean, I can really go on. We can spend uh, half an hour just to talk about her books, just the titles. Her book, Impolitic Bodies, published in 1998, received an award for the best book in medieval studies. For about four decades, uh, Professor uh, Delaney was closely associated with Science and Society, which is uh, world's longest continuously published Marxist journal. Um, it was established, Sheila, tell me uh, if I'm wrong, in 1934 or somewhere that time. Uh, she was on the journal's editorial board and on its manuscript collective, which reads manuscripts and approves and rejects uh, manuscripts. Anyone who has submitted anything to the journal would know how hard it is to, to get it, uh, to, get it uh, to, get, to get a paper out in the journal. It was in the science and society context that I came to know Professor Delani. I came to know of her as a person, know her as a person who was very thoughtful, who, is con who continues to be very thoughtful, and who takes her work extremely seriously. I uh, remembered something uh, uh, that Kolontai said. Kolontai said, I know I love love, I love all those things, but work is supreme. Um, then I came to know uh, her as an insightful scholar, uh, as, a, as a colleague, and as a passionate Marxist who is committed to the project of socialism, uh, to the idea of a much more humane society 
uh, in the entire world. She's an American from New Haven and now lives in Canada. She, of course, travels to the US uh, uh, regularly. She's one of Canada's um, outstanding uh, socialist and radical scholars easily. To learn, of course, more about Professor Delany's work, please visit her electronic office. Uh, if you type her name, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll go to the site. And um, so welcome, Sheila, to this uh, conversation on intellectual work and, and its politics. Um, so I will now would like to turn uh, the conversation to uh, Nitya, who is going to begin the actual interview part of, the, of this conversation. Thank you so much to everyone so far. Thank you, Professor Delaney, for joining us today. Um, I, as Raju has just, you know, listed, I mean, you have a very long and distinguished career with numerous publications. I wonder if we could start by just speaking, asking you about some of what, what you've been working on recently, some of the main kind of ideas that you've been uh, exploring. That's the first question. Sure. Well, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to thank my, my friend and colleague Raju for offering me this opportunity to reflect on um, my scholarly past, um, <clears throat> which I have to admit is kind of a challenging and somewhat disconcerting process. I mean, it's one thing when other people write about your work, which other people have done pro and con for me uh, quite a bit, but it's very different to do it uh, for yourself. I, I hope nobody thinks I was there at the founding of Science and Society in 1936. I'm old, but I'm not that old. So um, let me just talk about the last 15 to 20 years. I mean, I've been retired for 15 or 16 years now. And <clears throat> The, uh, I, this might take just slightly longer because when I retired, um, I went into a completely different field. What I've been working on from graduate school up to retirement was mostly medieval, not entirely. Um, and I was known as a Chaucerian um, and Chaucer of course lived from 1342 till 1400. And I worked on Christine de Pizan and, and uh, various other authors, not necessarily medieval, but mainly. After I retired, I completely shifted fields um, and I became a translator of a writer from the French Revolutionary period. His name was Sylvain Maréchal. He lived from 1750 to 1802. And um, he was an atheist and, and a revolutionary and so on. So what's interesting is that these two writers were at extreme opposites of the ideological spectrum and separated by 400 years of history. But for both of them, I use the same methods, that is class and gender awareness and close reading. So for Chaucer, Chaucer was a, a courtier and a minor diplomat um, throughout his life. He traveled to Italy and Spain on diplomatic missions. He was completely integrated into courtly life, even though he didn't himself come from an aristocratic background. He came from a middle-class background, but he was educated as a child and young man at the court of Lionel, the Black Prince, who is one of the sons of the king. And so uh, in those days, in the Middle Ages, middle-class people could uh, send their eight or nine or 10 year old children out to an employer to be trained into a particular field, whether it was you know, shoemaking or whatever. But in Chaucer's case, it was, he was being trained to be a courtier for the rest of his life. He went out uh, at the age of about nine to court to learn how to spend the rest of his life in court. And indeed that is uh, what he did. Uh, the English court at that time was the wealthiest in Europe. And um, he benefited from it and he did service. Uh, his service included probably marrying the probably pregnant mistress of uh, his main patron, John of Gaunt, uh, the king's brother. Uh, and of course he benefited from that service with a home in central London and uh, salaries and nice jobs such as customs inspector. And ideologically he had a quite conservative, um, basically Augustinian Catholicism, which he expressed in his uh, poetry. Um, he never mentioned the famous 
revolt of his day, the uh, great rebellion of uh, artisans and peasants of 1381. He ignored it completely, more or less. Um, okay, so that was up to retirement. Once I retired, um, I moved into the French Revolutionary period. And this is a period I'd always wanted to know more about. I, I had read a little bit uh, earlier um, and uh, I had run into Marischal while I was doing some medieval work. Um, he was a lifelong atheist and supporter of the French Revolution. And he wrote about uh, atheism. He was a very out atheist. He wasn't the only one in his day. Um, but he was a, a well-known playwright, poet, essayist, um, and editor of one of the best known revolutionary journals of his day. Um, so I, I accidentally uh, stumbled on uh, one of his works while working on something else. And um, I thought it was gonna be a counter-revolutionary document. It was called uh, La Nouvelle Légende Doré, The New Golden Legend. I thought it was gonna be very pro-Catholic and anti-revolutionary, but instead it turned out to be this very witty, uh, often nasty satire on, um, on the church and on hagiography, the saints lives, which was a very popular genre at the time, especially among uh, women readers, both rural and urban. And so I thought I would translate it one day. And, you know, 10 years later when I retired, I did. So from then until um, 2020, uh, I, I translated three of his works uh, with extensive notes and long introductions. One was that satirical um, legendary under the title of Anti-Saints, and then a short epistolary novella uh, about a cross-dressing woman who poses as a man in order to be near the handsome young priest that she is obsessed with. And she does extremely well in seminary disguised as a man. So it's, it's, it's just a very interesting text. And um, lastly, he wrote a very lengthy Bible commentary, uh, both scriptures, and um, called provocatively, uh, Pour et contre la Bible, for and against the Bible. Um, so for those, since retirement, I, I immersed myself in the French Revolutionary uh, Revolution, uh, both its primary documents, everybody wrote letters in those days, people kept diaries uh, and all, uh, newspapers, I loved it. And, um, and also the stellar, absolutely amazing recent scholarship, particularly from uh, France and Italy uh, about uh, the period, you know, the biographies and the, the social studies and so on. And so, I, you know, I published a fair amount um, on that too, and that can be found on my website. Um, so despite the temporal gap and the ideological antithesis, um, there was continuity. And I was surprised and, and gratified to find the continuity between medieval and uh, early modern, between 14th century and late 18th century. Um, so what I did um, as a medievalist was to emphasize class and Marxist method and gender awareness. I wrote against uh, the Eurocentrism and the Christian centrism uh, by looking at Jewish and Arabic issues in medieval literature where I saw them. Um, and all of this is pretty much mainstream by now, but it wasn't in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, when I started writing, um, people and scholars did not want to know that the Middle Ages was just as problematic and, and divided and troublesome as, as our own. Just anecdotally, um, I went to a conference in Australia uh, which, to which sort of cutting edge new writers uh, were invited. Uh, it would have been, I don't know, around the, late 80s or so. And the, aud the audience uh, consisted not only of other academics, it was at Melbourne, but of people from the city. They had been invited to come in and sit in on this conference. At one of the sessions, the audience literally rose from their seats screaming in protest against the picture of the Middle Ages 
that we had presented, we were challenging their paradigm of the Middle Ages as a period of static hierarchies where everybody knew their place and so on and so forth. You know, we were talking about revolts and, you know, uh, uh, semiotics and so on. So my work as a medievalist right from the get-go uh, and my first article published when I was a graduate student was to offer a counter hegemonic account of the dominant paradigm. Uh, of course, it was uh, interdisciplinary or as William Robertson would say, Robinson would say uh, transdisciplinary. Um, as a translator of Marischal, and I'll just say a couple of sentences about, about this, um, I wanted to bring Marischal into scholarly awareness. And I thought that um, his work might come into the public conversation about religion and politics. And so that was mainly what he wanted to write about religion, sex, religion, and politics, you know, the three taboo uh, topics for polite people. That was what he wrote about. And I wanted to bring that in. Um, so we'll, we'll see whether that happens. Um, so that's what I have to say about what I've been working on. Um, Nithya, do you want to? I, I do have a follow-up question, just based on what you have said, if I can, you know, I, I uh, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and what you've been speaking about. For me, it's quite new material, but I, I, I guess I have a general question, which is in general, you see, I mean, when, when we are referring back to, in a sense, you know, historical studies, um, um, I guess a question that, you know, in a sense, young people might ask is, you know, how are such historical works relevant, you know, in sort of in thinking about society today? And, and I think I was also, so that's a, a general question, but I think also I was quite interested if you might also elaborate a bit more, you know, when you spoke about the counter hegemonic paradigm, um, the kind of the, the struggle aspects, you know, of the period. And, and so if you might speak a bit more about Marx's method, the kind of the really the what you know, you see, you, you, you used the class and, and Marxist method, if you might elaborate a bit more on. Well, on basically, yeah, thank you. And those are the questions basically that I deal with in part two. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I can launch right, right into that. And, and then if I have left anything unanswered, maybe you can pick that up at, at the end. So do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> I'll just, let me just articulate to follow on what Nithya said and which is your point about the, the second part. So um, just following on that, um, just to make, make clear, especially to any uh, viewers, right, that we're, uh, we want to actually learn from you at this point is what in your view does your work imply for today's living struggles against capitalism and for the advancement of socialism around the world? So obviously what Nithya was just mentioning is a kind of bridge, a nice kind of conception yes. between that. So please, Sheila. Yeah, thank you. And, and your questions work really well as, as a bridge. So, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so what are the implications of my intellectual work for the fight against capitalism and for socialism? Now, I hate to disappoint my friend and colleague and co-thinker, Raju, but I have to confess that I have never had the... Uh, what I would say illusion that my work could be a weapon in real world political struggle. At best, I hoped it would help the reader or listener uh, to understand reality a bit better. Um, William Robert Robinson uh, observes in one of his essays, quote, theory needs to illuminate reality. It is useless as a tool for social action. End quote. I, I believe that knowledge doesn't necessarily produce a politics, but that, a, that politics or a political will often uh, produces knowledge or leads one to certain areas of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> I believe that academics, no matter how innovative their work or how leftist their opinions, change the world the way anyone else does. And that is through active engagement uh, in the political battles of their time, whether that be labor struggles or anti-colonial or anti-racist. And ideally they do this in the company of like-minded comrades uh, who have a serious program for revolutionary change. That's a lot to hope for. 
Um, for me personally, uh, this has been labor and anti-racist struggles uh, domestically and on the international level, Cuba, Vietnam and Palestine have been the main issues that I have um, spent activist time in, in organizations and, you know, giving speeches at rallies and going to demonstrations and so on and organizing. While I was still living in New York in the 60s, um, I, had, I was close contact with the Progressive Labor Party then in its best days. And later, after I moved to Vancouver in 1970, I spent several years membership in the International Spartacist Tendency, then also in its best days in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> and my idea always was how to bring a Marxist politics and activism into my scholarship, not that scholarship, whatever its content, could be a substitute for active organizational participation. So that, that's just the basic starting point for me. Nonetheless, um, even in my first job, which was at Queens College in the City University of New York, uh, when I was teaching composition and general literature courses and the novel and so on, um, I did implement methods of teaching that uh, students of varying uh, cultural and racial and economic backgrounds uh, could relate to uh, what Stanley Aronowitz would have called, quote, postmodern education. I'm, I'm not a, a, an enthusiast of most of Aronowitz's work, though, I, I want to say. I mean, I don't go for the whole postmodern thing. Um, and I wrote about this in a very early essay uh, written in about 1968 and published in 1970 um, called uh, The Collection. It was called The Politics of Literature. And it was the title of that piece, uh, which I, I entitled Up Against the Great Tradition, that the editor of one of the two uh, retirement fest shrifts, uh, one American and one Canadian, um, used for her essay about my career, Up Against the Great Tradition, uh, which she thought summarized my, my career. Uh, it was a, a clever use of that. On the most pragmatic level, I suppose that one way in which um, my teaching uh, might have helped social progress was that maybe a few students at Simon Fraser did actually join left political organizations as a consequence of our discussions in and out of class. And I, I, I should add that uh, one of my courses that I taught quite frequently was Marxism and the Arts in which we were able, of course, we had to read actual Marxist texts on art and culture, plus artistic work by Marxist or communist or fellow traveling writers. But for most of what I wanna say, I'll focus on the more challenging uh, area of literature per se, which is mostly medieval. So <clears throat> when I first came to Vancouver, and I spoke a lot at conferences uh, here and abroad or meetings, I was often asked the question that Nitya basically uh, just posed, which was why Chaucer? Like by which people meant why in the world would somebody who was an out uh, Marxist, uh, somebody of communist convictions <clears throat> choose to work on a reactionary writer from a, an overall reactionary period, rather than, for example, somebody uh, modern or early modern writing overtly pro-worker or pro-peasant or pro-revolutionary novels or poetry. So I, I think I can respond to that question and uh, Nietzsche's um, in the same way. Now, if I look at Marischal, that's fairly simple. I mean, I chose him because of his, ideal, his left ideological stance, his pro-revolutionary ideological stance. And I thought that introducing his anti-religious pro-revolutionary sensibility into uh, the world of modern readers might help shift the public conversation a little bit to the left. Um, if some people buy the books or teach them and take them content seriously. For Chaucer, it's a lot more complicated, or for you know, medieval studies generally, certainly, you know, Christine de Pisan <clears throat> and others. Um, because 
somebody like Chaucer is much better known than Marischal and of course widely taught and also much less socially progressive. Um, basically, the idea is that it's not only what you teach or write about, but how you teach or write about it. So I, I might have used the phrase literature per se uh, a minute ago, but I shouldn't have because there really isn't such a thing as literature per se um, that is in or of or by itself. And that's one of the points that I would want to make as a teacher or scholar. Now, some people, of course, do think that there is. I mean, the new critics of the 40s and 50s, for example, and uh, when I got to college, um, that was my training. Uh, and, and I'm glad I had it. Uh, it gave me a good eye for, for detail and uh, the uh, internal dynamics of uh, poetry or prose. But obviously, a Marxist literary scholar is going to have to be a historicist of one kind or another. That's because we want to be dialectical, which means looking at where something comes from and what it is in all of its relationships and where it's going. And we also want to be materialists in the philosophical sense, um, taking into account the ways in which a material environment or material culture might help to shape a writer's consciousness and his or her literary work or production or, or lack of production actually, which is an equally important uh, thing to consider. So I emphasize might help and might and help because I, I don't intend a crude determ material uh, determinism. Um, so this is a very broad canvas uh, that could include all kinds of physical features of urban or rural or manorial or courtly or clerical life, uh, could include biography, economy, class structure, um, specific events such as regime change or uprisings uh, or travel, uh, family life institutions such as a court or a church or a university. So this is not to leave aside individual inspiration or genius, but really to contextualize them because, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that genius in the 14th century is not the same as uh, genius in the 20th or 21st century. So <clears throat> what might be the positive positive influences of a Marxist scholarship in literature, how might it conduce to developing the consciousness of say, a college student or a young scholar in the direction of social change? I wanna make three, I'll take up three points here. First, um, something that I found, uh, was first is the continuity or the omnipresence or constant resurgence of revolutionary thought and action down the ages. People don't always realize that there has always been revolution and protest and uprising. I mean, back to the Roman period, the Spartacus, Spartacus revolt, slave revolt, right up through the Middle Ages and Renaissance and you know, to our own day. So even though Geoffrey Chaucer ignored the revolt of 1381, I mean, by the way, he had a house uh, over one of the uh, gates to London through which the rebels would probably have had to pass to enter the city. I mean, there's no way he didn't know about it. It was happening right under his nose, almost literally. So even though he ignored in his work, the revolt of 1381, except for one little remark about how noisy the rebels were uh, in the nun's priest tale, you can teach about it precisely as something that he ignored and invite students to think about why a writer would ignore such a major event happening right in front of him. You can talk about the many revolts in many European countries, how this 
English revolt of 1381 was by no means isolated. And this is a surprise to many people who, who think about that period as static and quiet and, you know, uh, people weren't changing class. I mean, actually they were changing class a lot in the Middle Ages, um, you know, serfs running away from uh, the land to, to go into the cities where they could be free and becoming artisans and so on. Lots of class bourgeois trying to marry into the aristocracy, aristocrats losing their uh, properties and becoming impoverished, et cetera. A tremendous amount of class shifting around um, in the Middle Age, especially the, the, the high or late Middle Ages. Um, so you can point out that uh, these revolts and changes of class weren't always even by artisans or peasants. Um, some like the one that resulted in Magna Carta were uh, by barons against a king. Others were by bourgeois against uh, the feudal limits to their uh, profit making. Some were by prosperous artisans who wanted more commercial freedom. So issues of class can, can be addressed uh, frontally and, and hard uh, in teaching a reactionary uh, writer. And, and basically the recurrence of protest and revolutions, let's say even a normalization of protest and revolutionary activity um, is important against uh, the current propagandistic and, and general uh, recent uh, propaganda effort to portray protest and revolution as somehow eccentric, somehow abnormal. Uh, no, it's not eccentric, it's not a, abnormal, it's been happening. And this was the uh, theme, by the way, of my, my first book, um, which I'm gonna show you the cover of, because I like the cover so much. It's a Blake watercolor, Blake watercolor, which I chose. I try to pick, I try to design the covers of my books. And this watercolor, I thought perfectly um, exemplifies the notion of dialectic, that you have these two different um, figures struggling within a frame. Uh, the book is called Counter Tradition, and it was a collection of uh, written pieces from all ages dating back to the Bible. And if I were to do a second edition, I might change that. But from the Bible right up to what was then the present, like about 1970, uh, to show that indeed there has always been counter traditional uh, activity and writing. Okay, so that was point one, the continuity that you can teach. Um, point two, um, the stubborn survival of old ways. Now, since Marischal was a retirement project, I never had the opportunity to teach his work, but if I had, one of the points I have made, and I've made it in the writing um, about, that I've done about his work um, and the revolutionary period uh, is about the stubborn survival of the old ways. Specifically, the Middle Ages survived well into the 18th century, right, right through to the end of the 18th century. And this is something I was interested to, to find out as a medievalist. It survived into the, uh, almost to the 19th century in the form of three, the three basic medieval social institutions. One, the absolute monarchy. Two, the hegemonic Catholic church with all its corruption. And three, the feudal system of land ownership and feudal uh, duties attached to peasants who farmed the land. Um, and it was the aim of the French Revolution to either modify, that is reform, or to eliminate all three of them. The new National Assembly that got started in, in uh, 1789 had a feudalism committee uh, whose task was to deal with the land issue, uh, feudalism in uh, land uh, ownership. And they did. Um, the other two, not immediately, but they, they did. The other two institutions, that is uh, the monarchy and the church, 
were more complicated to deal with. Uh, looking at the church, um, some church leaders were pro-revolutionary, others were violently anti. And the, the ones who, who hated the revolution, the church people, the priests, who went into exile in England, returned in triumph under Napoleon. Uh, so the reforms about, of the church that the revolution had been able to accomplish were limited and some of them were reversed. Uh, this is in fact why Marischal wrote his scathingly anti-religious Bible commentary in 1802 uh, as a kind of last gasp of the revolutionary uh, spirit uh, against the dominance of the Catholic Church. And he, he could see it uh, being extinguished around him. And this was his, and, and I think the culture's uh, one of the last um, statements of, of the, the revolution for which so many men had, uh, and women had died uh, in the previous decade and, and more. Um, about royalty, um, the initial intent of the revolutionaries was reform, not abolition. They wanted to have a constitutional monarchy like the one in England. But then um, the treasonous acts of uh, Louis and Marie Antoinette created a demand for their trial and death and the abolition of monarchy. But that didn't happen until a few years uh, into uh, the revolution. And again, this abolition of the monarchy was only partly successful um, because a monarchy uh, did return some years later in the 19th century, but it didn't survive into the modern period. So the, the underlying point here is that the old ways die hard, very hard, and often very late. But over time, and with sufficient uh, effort against them, uh, they can and do die. So I think that that historical perspective is useful for people today so that they don't give up in the face of defeat. And I want to quote Rosa Luxemburg here, uh, as she movingly put it in her last published article before her death um, about the defeat of the Spartacist revolt of 1919. She was responding to a bourgeois press article gloating over the defeat uh, of that uh, revolt. And the press article was called Order Reigns in Berlin. I hope I can make it through this without choking up. Um, quote, the road, to social, the road of socialism is covered with defeats. The question is under what circumstances did each defeat occur? Order reigns in Berlin, you stupid lackeys. Your order is built on sand. Tomorrow, this is the hard part. Tomorrow the revolution will rear its head once again and to your horror will proclaim, I was, I am, I will be. That was the last thing she published. I mean, what a statement of, of faith. Um, actually, I taught this short uh, piece um, as an example of prose rhetoric in one of my classes on, on rhetoric. Um, fortunately, the major Marxists, this is just a little footnote, uh, including uh, Karl Marx, were excellent stylists, uh, albeit in different ways. So the point here is how to deal with defeat and the importance of a long range perspective, both backward and forward. Now, um, part three, um, or my third point here, I mentioned uh, the question, why Chaucer, that I used to get a lot. Um, and I partly answered it already by saying that it isn't only what one writes about, but how uh, one writes or, or speaks about it, that is methods and values. But I, I think there's a, a, maybe a deeper dive into that question that I want to take. Um, and that is the theoretical or political underpinnings of the question itself, um, which I would describe as implicitly ultra left. 
because it assumes that only something explicitly left or explicitly revolutionary can yield a revolutionary message or lesson. But actually, there is a tradition of Marxist writing about non-Marxist uh, work, even anti-communist or reactionary work. This is because if a reactionary writer is any good, he or she is, is going to be telling the truth and is going to be exposing the realities of his or her society. So in this vein, Marx and Engels wrote glowingly about the royalist writer, Honoré de Balzac. They didn't write at length, unfortunately, but in a couple of letters uh, to, to other people. Lenin and Trotsky wrote several laudatory articles each about Tolstoy, uh, whose peasant romanticism they, of course, politically couldn't support, but they appreciated what a great writer he was and how he showed the realities of the Russia of his day, just as Balzac showed the realities of, of the middle, middle class uh, French uh, society. Um, Trotsky also wrote on uh, Céline, on Gorky, on Jack London, on Winston Churchill. Um, yeah, so Lenin made an observation in left-wing communism and infantile disorder that I think is relevant here. Quote, all dividing lines in nature and society are mutable and to a certain extent conventional. So this is why he and Trotsky uh, so strongly opposed the literary trend of the time that was called prolet cult, uh, which aimed at uh, uh, creating a proletarian culture right away, right away, um, because they knew that the revolution uh, couldn't create a proletarian culture. It didn't have time. A culture takes a long time to uh, create. So they aim to make the best of bourgeois culture and bourgeois knowledge, uh, art, science, literature, mathematics. They made, wanted to make them available to those who had been excluded. They built museums in the provinces for that very purpose, um, not to mention everything else that they did in uh, the cultural realm until Stalin turned it around. So the bottom line is um, you use what you can use to forward your purpose. Uh, and uh, so that, that's about what I have to say. The end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, does anybody have any follow up? Do you have any follow up questions that occurred to you? Or um, I mean, I don't have a, a, I don't, I don't think that I have a question per se, but I, I, I just want to say I found what you've uh, explained very enriching. I mean, in terms of the emphasis that you're you know, placing on this kind of, I guess, Marxist method, you know, this mm -hmm. materialist method as, as which is like, I guess, a, a, a crucial point that, you know, um, I mean, and people like Bertel Ullman make about that we need to actually engage with Marxist method. In fact, that is the kind of the, the core of Marxism. So I, I think that's very helpful in a sense to grasp in a sense how, you know, you deploy this, uh, even in the context of study of writers who are not revolutionary. And I, and I think in terms of de debunking the, the, the myths as you, as you talked about, you know, and, I, and, and the significance of, in a sense, um, you know, the kind of ideological condition today where we um, are not either accustomed to the notion that struggle has been around for a long time or that one must struggle in order to to succeed. Um, so I, I think from those standpoints, I, I found your um, explanation, um, well, very enlightening. Um, I, I don't have a specific question yet to- That's fine. <laughs> Good. I'll mean, just follow up. I know, Roger, you, you look like you're gonna, you have a quick. Um, I think you're on mute, but I would just say something. Yeah, yeah about the reality question. All, all the things that you were emphasizing, Sheila, right, do speak to what you originally started with, instead of saying theory or knowledge or academically generated knowledge, but how we understand, see, think about reality, right? Mm -hmm. And all the things that you talked about, like the historical perspective, right? Uh, the role of um, 
broader cultural forms in relationship to the people, right? Um, the question of historical time and transformation, right? All of those are very different ways of seeing reality compared to many times what we may be force fed or even from our own uh, radical perspectives will come to want to assume, right? So I think, yeah, there's a tremendous area there uh, to be, um, in a sense, uh, developed in, in all kinds of areas of work. And, and clearly you've been doing that in your work. So, but... I think Sheila might uh, get some questions from the audience. We'll see how we can facilitate this. Okay. Just as there are you know, questions arising in our minds while listening to uh, Sheila, just you know viewers when they listen to her you know to the to the audio and to the video they may have questions but uh one of my takeaways there are many one of my takeaway points from what Sheila just said is um to be a socialist to be a marxist one cannot confine oneself to reading only what one likes which is or oh, marxist stuff uh, socialist stuff etc um, Lenin had said, said something uh, along these lines, uh, 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 and Sheila made one point. But another point is, for example, with respect to class analysis, he said, it's not enough that we understand only capitalists and workers. No, that's not enough. We have to understand all the classes of society, merchants, landlords, uh, you know, the peasantry, everyone. So then he, so his view of class analysis was, it's an analysis of class society as a whole, rather than just the two main classes. Uh, and then, uh, but anyways, but I had something else along, uh, you know, the, uh, to, to bring to your attention, Sheila, which, which you know about. Uh, uh, one of Lenin's famous lines was, no revolutionary movement would be possible without revolutionary theory. You said something very interesting in the beginning. You said, well, ideas cannot cause a revolution or social change. Um, the role of ideas is to understand. That's what you said. I think that's quite right. That is right. But here is what, uh, uh, and, and I told you, uh, I said what, what Lenin said, revolutionary theory is important for revolutionary ideas. But then, what Marx himself said on this, I, I just want your, your, your very quick, very quick uh, response to this. He said, uh, it's not enough to produce critical ideas because you need really, uh, he said, material force must encounter material force, meaning there has to be a revolution. Sure. But he says, ideas, or he, he said theory, ideas can become a material force under two conditions. I actually tweeted about this I sent a series of tweets about this uh, last night, in the middle of the night. Okay. So, so ideas, ideas can become a material force, he said, on the two conditions. One, and supporting your point, ideas must grasp the reality at its root. And by doing that, it will, ideas will grip the minds of the masses. When it does these two things, ideas, never remain ideas, they become like a material force. My question to you, Sheila, is based on your vast scholarship over four or five decades, have you seen evidence of this, either in your own work or in the work that you are, you are familiar with? Sorry, um, have I seen evidence of- Of this, of this idea that ideas, yeah, ideas can become like a material force under these two conditions. Sorry, the, I only got one condition. The, the first one is grasp. ideas have to grasp the reality at its root. root. And the second is? The second is I, by doing that, ideas grip the minds of the masses. The ideas, he says grip. Ideas grip the masses. Meaning yes. lots of people come yes. to accept those ideas and they well, become informed. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you just you talked about how your ideas have informed many students who have I, I gone on think, to do left politics. I don't think it would be my work so much, but you know, yeah. I, I'm thinking of other other people's 
work. I mean, we we before we started recording, Nietzsche and I talked a little bit about Palestine. Right. And I mean, there's a situation where, you know, ideas are in a good situation because of the extremity of the situation right. uh, to grasp the minds of the masses. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, uh, one state versus two state of Palestine. I mean, this is a whole, this can be, uh, uh, this is a, a theoretical and practical issue that's going to mm -hmm. grasp people's minds and result in how they work, what kind of work they do. Um, so uh, that's what came to mind okay. most yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. If you want to, if you're asking about uh, literary scholarship in North America, not so much. <laughs> you know. And I think you'd have to look to to serious political events or or Cuba, perhaps, um, where you know there are um, ideas put forward uh, to the Cuban masses about what their social what socialism or you know their deformed worker state is doing and can do. And I mean, th those are the kinds of situations uh, where I think Marx's um, idea really uh, applies. And of course, you know, it's important to remember that, that he was very involved in organizational matters all the time, yeah. uh, both worker organizations and, um, political organizations. And he, at, at, in his day, people were looking to possibly Germany as uh, the, the site of a revolution, a workers' revolution, or maybe England as the site of a, a, a workers' revolution. So it was very real, very real, very immediate to them in ways that it isn't in uh, North America today, but it, but, but, you know, is elsewhere, you know. I also want to say one more thing uh, for the benefit of the, of the audio, for the, of the viewers. Uh, Professor Delani once advised me, uh, we, we talk quite regularly. And one of the, one of the, one of, one of the things he, she once said, Raju, it's important to read what Marx was reading when he was reading. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think that's a very, that's an excellent piece of advice because we always read what Marx wrote or, or whatever. But what was Marx reading and we should read? And what was he reading? Literature, dra you know, uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. Shakespeare, yeah, I yeah. No, no, they were, they I, I, th I think this is a great point. Uh, so again, I, I, want, I want to emphasize this. One of the takeaway points for me is Oh, as a socialist, as a Marxist, we should not be reading only Marxist socialist literature. For example, about Ukraine, a lot of my own information comes from former American soldiers who are writing about Ukraine. They're not academics, they're not Marxists, they're not socialists, but I learn a great deal from them, for example, in terms of ideas and what, where things going, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, that's a great piece of advice and, and great insight, really. For, for me, uh, I'm embarrassed. I can't. Jacques Derrida wrote a wonderful book. I think it was called Specters of Marx. It yes. was about Marx and Shakespeare. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you a follow-up question, if it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's just about the, what what you mentioned now about literature. You know, it made me think about the discipline of literature, and and um, in a sense, I mean, so much of the writing. Um, you know, that we tend to do is a, a very kind of conventional, it's like, you know, political arguments that we make, but literature and poetry are very different forms. And I wondered if you might speak a little bit about th this form and, and its, let's say, connections um, to Marxist method is, is, is um, I don't know if, if that, uh, for example, I mean, in poetry, you know, one, one often, poetry is a very interesting form because you, you find the kind of, the, the negation, the, 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 the op oppositions are always present, you know, um, and so there's this kind of unity that, that you can 
speak about. So I, I don't know. I, I wondered if if you had any um, general thoughts about literature as a discipline and and kind of what 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 makes it particularly interesting. I, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that's that's I, I I don't know if I can satisfactorily answer your question, but but I'm one of the things that um, continues uh, down the millennia. Is 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 rhetoric and and you know the desire to impose form on language and you know the the the, the Greek and the Roman uh, forms of rhetoric are certainly uh, definitely something that medieval any medieval writer worth his or her salt would have studied and incorporated into his or her work and same thing in the 18th and 19th century it, it's another one of those. It's a cult, another co cultural continuity that survives, and and Rosa Luxemburg too. You know, she's and Marx. They all studied uh, the formal properties of language. They wanted to give meaningful form to their writing. Um, I, I wrote an article on um, on this uh, years and years ago, uh, and it was published in a journal called Style. And uh, I, it, it was, I, I did analyses of some writings by the main um, writers uh, and um, found that uh, Stalin didn't have a very good style rhetorically. <laughs> I was kind of happy to find that out, that somehow there seemed to be a correlation between what I considered good politics and good style. <laughs> but um, so the formal question, yeah, uh, form counts. People, structure, you know, structure. I mean, it's to do with structure. And if you want to transpose that, this may be completely off off, but if you want to transpose that into the political arena, uh, it has to do with program and line, which would be the structural components, as opposed to say an anarchist uh, approach, you know, in language or in politics. You know, you would you would want there to be. Uh, a structure, you would want there to be a form, i.e. A, a program uh, and a form to the state. You know, you would want there to be a state, which is a form, right? You know, you wouldn't want there to be anarchy. Well, that's, that's a, a, big, a, it's a big question. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very big question. Unfortunately, to what you said. <laughs> yeah, we've come to the end of our time because we wanted to keep our, our interview in the contained period. So it's accessible for a lot of people. Um, and uh, so we're going to bring the close and thank you so much, Sheila. Thank, thank you, Sheila. All thank that you, you so much. Thank you. And hope to see you again soon. <laughs>